Hi, good morning. So for our first lab activity, one of the things that I want you to think about is some other ways to get creative in terms of how you're going to go through studying and learning this information without having um, everything that you might have in a regular anatomy and physiology lab. Okay. So right behind me, we can see over here, this is an anatomical model, which I'll be using for my video presentations. Um, this bad boy here is quite expensive, and I don't expect any of you to run out and purchase something like this. Um, <clears throat> we will be doing some videos with this model and a few other models. If I take a quick turn of the camera, you can see throughout the lab, we have quite a few models that I'll be utilizing. Okay. Um, now, I have posted a list on Blackboard of some more reasonably priced anatomical models that you might want to purchase, um, you might want to look into renting. But you also need a certain degree of creativity when you're going through and taking an online course like this. So today, I stopped at the dollar store on my way into school, and I picked up this doll here. Now, this is not exactly an anatomically correct doll. It's a $1 version of a Barbie doll. Right? But it can be useful in terms of a study tool. So the first uh, lab lecture, which is recorded, on, recorded separately with a PowerPoint, goes through different anatomical terms. And this follows along with the lab book, right, the first exercise, which is the language of anatomy. So if you are looking at page three in the lab book right now, you see that there's a diagram of a human. And there are different anatomical terms. Right? So what I've done is I've taken this doll, and if you take a close look, I'll put her right up to the camera. I've begun going through and labeling those on this doll. Right? Now this is going to be a more active way of studying rather than just looking at a two-dimensional drawing. Right? So as I go through and studying this, let's say, for example, I want to note that the chin region is the mental region. Right? I'm actually going to write on this mental. Uh, spell it correctly. So if you take a look now, I have that the forehead region is frontal, the chin region is mental. On the back here, I've written vertebral for the area of the vertebrae. I'll now fill in the lumbar area. Now, I'm not going to require you to do this, of course. I'm not going to ask you to mail me in a doll. Right? But this is a really inexpensive but good way to study. Okay. Um, now, people might think you're strange if they see you walking around with a doll, so you might want to stick it in your backpack. Right? So let's just use this and just quickly run through some of the different uh, anatomical terms just to kind of review. Right? So when we start off on top, anything having to do with the head is cephalic. The forehead is frontal. The chin is mental. The area of the eyes is orbital. Areas having to do with the ears is the otic. Uh, within the mouth is oral. The area of the neck is cervical. I'm going to write that one on, actually. Cervical. The area of the chest that would be enclosed with the rib cage, um, which I've drawn in with black lines, that would be thoracic. Right? Running down the middle would be sternal. The points of the shoulder are acromial. In the back of the body, where the scapula will be, which is the shoulder blades, okay, that would be the scapular region. I'm going to write that on real quick. Okay. Vertebral running down the area of where you'd find your spine. The lumbar region. The lumbar region is where the back curves in. If you have a car that has good back support, it's called lumbar support. Um, the area of the buttocks, which are not terribly anatomically correct on this Barbie doll, um, that would be gluteal. Right. On the front, we have the abdominal, the umbilical. I drew in a little belly button on this. That would be the umbilical region. The pelvic region, and then the pubic region, the inguinal region, right. then working our way to the, the upper limb, uh, we have the brachial, right. the antebrachial, right. the area of the elbow is the olecranon, the front of the elbow is the antecubital, right. the hand right, is the manis. Right. Now working to the lower limbs, femoral would be the area of what we would call the thigh, the back of the knee is the popliteal. The front of the knee would be the patellar. And because that's a big word in a small area, I've actually kind of going to break it up across both knees, so patellar. And we'll see that that comes from the name of the bone that forms a kneecap. Oops. So patellar, uh, area of the foot that is pedal, like you pedal a bicycle, right? Or a person who walks is a pedestrian, that has to do with feet, right? So it's just a quick review of how you might be able to use something like this, a, an inexpensive um, but handy way 
to go through and actually study some of these anatomical terms. Right. So now while we're here, let's just use our inexpensive little study doll. And in addition to going through the anatomical terms for this first lab exercise, we also need to talk about the directional terms. So those directional terms talk about where different parts of the body are in relation to other parts. So towards the head would be superior. Towards the feet, or towards the bottom, would be inferior. Towards the midline of the body would be medial, whereas towards the outside, that would be lateral. Um, towards the front would be anterior. Towards the back would be posterior. When we're talking about the limbs, we also have some special terms, which are proximal and distal. And those have to do with where something is in relation to the origin of that limb. So something that is proximal is closer to the origin of the limb, whereas something that's distal is further away. Okay. So the hand is distal to the elbow. The elbow is proximal to the hand. Right. So these are relation terms. Another thing which, heart, which is not going to be very easy to demonstrate on this model has to do with superficial and deep. Right? So superficial is towards the outside of the body. So you can imagine the skin would be superficial. Deep would be inside. So that would be where the organs are. And that will be the next thing that we're going to look at and talk about. Now I'm going to put our little $1 study aid away. Right? But I do really recommend trying to do something like that. That is the active part of learning where you're actually going to go and have a chance to um, involve yourself in the learning. Right? So we're going to switch gears um, and we're just going to quickly talk about uh, the uh, body cavities um, and we're going to talk about the internal organs. I'm going to do these at the same time. They're in two different exercises. So the body cavities are covered in exercise one um, and the organ overview is covered in organ systems overview which is exercise two in the lab book which begins on page uh, 15 in the lab book. Now most of this lab is doing a rat dissection. Now you're obviously not going to do a rat dissection. I'm not going to send rats to your house and have you dissect them and I don't recommend that you do that. Um, what I will do instead is we're going to use a human model to go through the organ systems um, and then I will also separately do a quick video overview of a dissected rat so you can take a look at it. But the diagrams that are in the lab book should be sufficient. Um, really the rat dissection just serves as a way for you to take a look at the organs that you may see later on. So we're going to use a human model for that. Okay. So you can follow along on page 23 in the lab book is a human model similar to what we'll be looking at. Okay. So let me bring up my more expensive um, kind of fancy model. I'm going to have to angle this down a little bit. Here we go. So this is my human model. I'm going to try and get him positioned in a good way. Now this human model um, is going to be representative of the different organ systems that we'll be seeing either beginning in A and P1 and then you'll continue on in A and P2. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly just review those anatomical terms. So the area that's bound with the rib cage, that's the thoracic area. Right? The area that is the soft muscle, this would be the abdominal pelvic area. Now if I remove this outer covering, okay, you'll see that we have there a body cavity. And a cavity is an opening within the body. Right? So this body cavity here that would be bound by rib cage on the front sides and back and by a thin muscle wall called the diaphragm in the inferior region this is the thoracic body cavity. Below this we have this larger body cavity which will be bound mostly by muscle and the pelvic floor. Okay, that is the abdominal pelvic cavity. So we're going to follow from these body cavities and I'm going to start taking a look at the different organs. So we'll begin up towards the top Okay. These organs, they are bilateral, one on each side. These are the lungs. The lungs are part of the respiratory system. The lungs expand and fill with air and are important in how the body gets its oxygen. So I'm going to remove the lungs out of the way. Um, lungs are very delicate tissues. You will look at these more in depth in um, anatomy and physiology too, actually, when you do the respiratory system. Then there is this structure here that's sitting on top of the heart. This is called the thymus. The thymus is most active in young people. Uh, it becomes less and less active as we age. It's actually involved in the maturation of certain cells called T cells, which are part of the immune system. Okay, so that would be the thymus. Then just below the thymus, sitting above the diaphragm, is your heart. The heart is a 
pump. It serves to pump blood throughout the body. Right. Um, the heart will be studied in depth in the cardiovascular system. Right. Now the heart by itself can't function, it has to be connected to blood vessels, hence the reason the heart being part of the cardiovascular system. Now, this is showing you where you would have the thoracic cavity. I'm just going to move this a little bit closer so we can see a bit more in depth some of the structures here. Uh, where the lungs meet, um, this is going to be called the trachea. The trachea has these cartilaginous rings in it. The trachea is what you would consider your windpipe. Right. The trachea has these cartilaginous rings in it made of cartilage that help to keep the windpipe open. So there's always an open airway. Now, when I take this other portion of the lung out, I have to remove these other organs to see it. You'll see that there is this branching here. The trachea branches into two bronchi, and those bronchi branch into smaller things called bronchioles. And those end at the actual areas of the lung that do gas exchange. And that will be covered more in depth when you take a look at uh, the respiratory system. Now, if we follow this up a little bit, you'll notice that there's a structure here. Okay, this is called the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a very important gland. It's part of the endocrine system. Uh, the endocrine system is a very diffuse system. It's found throughout the body, and it's part of the control system of the body. It's part of the slow control system of the body. Right? And what the endocrine system does, endocrine glands release chemical signals which travel throughout the body and have various effects throughout the body. Now, just behind this bronchus, you'll notice this area right here. Right, this is a collapsible tube. It's made of smooth muscle and connective tissue. That is called the esophagus. The esophagus is where food and liquids pass through when we swallow them, and it leads down into the stomach. Right? The stomach is down over here, and we'll take a closer look at that in a second. Right. So here, this is the thoracic cavity. Now we're going to angle down a little bit lower. This is the diaphragm. This diaphragm is a muscular structure right, that actually allows, when it contracts, it drops down and it increases the size of the thoracic cavity and it allows us to intake air, okay, which is called inspiration. Now I'm going to try and remove this diaphragm. The diaphragm acts as the boundary between the thoracic and the abdominal pelvic cavity. Once we're in the abdominal pelvic cavity, we're going to see that this is where we have most of our organs of digestion. So this top largest organ, this is the liver. Um, if you compare the human to the rat dissection in the lab, you'll notice that the rat's liver is much larger. Um, the liver, one of the things that the liver does has to do with um, cleaning and detoxifying the body. And you can imagine that rats can eat pretty much anything. Right? One of the reasons that they're able to do that is that there's an extremely large liver that helps to keep their blood clean and free of um, toxins. So I'm going to pull this liver out of the way. You can take a look at the liver. Right? If you notice under here, there's this green sac. Okay, that green sac is the gallbladder. The gallbladder houses bile, which will be released into the small intestine um, for digestion. The, bl the bile is actually produced by the liver, though. Okay, it's actually produced by the liver. Now, sitting below, we can now see the esophagus it goes directly into the stomach. Okay. The stomach is a muscular pouch. Um, it is where food goes to be digested. Um, there is some degree of chemical digestion that occurs there, and then, of course, mechanical digestion, so the stomach actually contracts. Now, if you've ever experienced heartburn, heartburn um, is actually usually due to acid leaving the stomach and going back up the esophagus. The reason people call it heartburn is if you put the heart back in place, okay, the heart sits right here. The mouth of the stomach, right, what we have is called the gastroesophageal sphincter, where the stomach meets the, I mean, where the stomach meets the esophagus, actually sits right behind the heart. Right? It's very high up. So when people have heartburn, it's actually usually due to acid entering the esophagus. The stomach has a lot of um, mucus surrounding it to protect it from acid. The esophagus does not. Right. So let's take this stomach out for a second. I'm just going to quickly open it. Um, and if you notice, the stomach is going to have lots of uh, contractile elements. It's going to be heavily muscular, right? so that it's actually able to contract to help mix up food and create what's called chyme. Now just below this, I'm just going to rearrange the camera for one second. 
Now below this, right, we get into where we see our intestines. Right? So exiting the stomach, the partially digest food, which is now called chyme, is going to enter into the small intestine. So the small intestines continue with the digestive system. The small intestines are narrower in circumference, but they're longer in total length. Those wrap around throughout this whole area down over here. Okay. You can kind of see how they wrap around and they go throughout the area. And then we have this area called the large intestine. So in the small intestine, we have digestion occurring. And we're also going to see there's lots and lots of absorption occurring. So there's lots of folds in here. Then we get to this area called the large intestine. And I'm going to actually pull this out a little bit. Okay. So we can take a look at this closer. So here would be the area of the small intestine. This would be the large intestine. The large intestine is predominantly where water would be reabsorbed. And that's where the leftover food that cannot be digested gets compacted and dehydrated. And it turns into what we call feces. The feces then would be released from the body. Now when we've successfully removed the intestines, right, we can see that there's a small section of intestine left here. Okay? And then with this organ here, which is called the pancreas. Okay? The pancreas is very important. The pancreas actually produces many enzymes that are important in digestion. Now if we take a look at this, this would be the um, the abdominal cavity here. Lower down would be the pelvic cavity. So <laughs> mounted in the back over here, we would have the kidneys. Okay? The kidneys are part of the urinary or excretory system. And what those do is they help to also detoxify the blood. Um, they help to filter. Okay? We could remove one area here. We see they have a huge amount of blood supply. The blood passes through. And that's how urine is produced. Urine is actually the removal of what are called nitrogenous wastes. And those are left over from proteins. Up here, kind of tucked away, this would be the spleen. Okay? Um, the spleen is often damaged. Um, in things like accidents because you can see that it's very close to the edge of the body wall. Okay? Um, the spleen is important in removing used red blood cells. Now further down the very bottom of this cavity, this would be called the pelvic cavity. Right? So we have the abdominal ca pelvic cavity is made up of the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. So I'm actually going to remove portions of this. So when we open this up right, and we take a look here, we would see that this would be the area where we would have feces that would pass out through the anus. Okay. Um, we would also have the bladder and the uterus. Okay. This would be the cervix of the uterus. Okay. Um, so this is where the organs of reproduction would be housed. Now if this was a male, we would see different organs of reproduction in the pelvic cavity. All right. So we'll just place these back in. So that completes our overview of the thoracic and abdominal cavities, which are the ventral body cavities. I just want to quickly take a look at what would be called the dorsal body cavities or the back body cavities. One of these would be called the um, cranial cavity. And the cranial cavity here is where we would have the brain housed. Okay. So if we take a look, right, we'll look at the brain in depth in later chapters. But you can imagine the open space of the skull right here, this open space, that is the cranial cavity. We also have, and it's not very clear on this model, we also have a cavity, if I could remove this head for a moment, we also have a cavity that passes down and it's a space in between the vertebrae and that's where the spinal cord goes and we'll see that in chapter 12. Okay, that is called the vertebral cavity. Okay, so those different cavities are the dorsal body cavities. Now, as I said initially, um, with these types of models, there are some inexpensive models that you can go out and you can purchase or rent. If you take a look, one of the important assignments that you'll do with this lab is to use the practice anatomy lab that's found in the Mastering A&P. Um, and I will have that in the assignment as well. The practice anatomy lab will give you both human cadaver and different models to look at.